All right, welcome Fox back to Pints News. and Politics. This is episode 27. Um, this is the summer edition. I'm wearing flip-flops and shorts, and uh, Representative Guffey is on assignment in uh, Louisville, uh, Kentucky. On a, He's at a legislator conference, so filling in today, special guest, Senator Wes Clymer. How are we doing? Doing great, man. Good to be with you. I've yeah. listened to the show a good bit, and uh, nice to co-host with you today. Yeah, thanks, man. Well, it's been a while. I, we were just um, recollecting our last episode was during just after the Trump assassination yeah. attempt. A lot has happened since then, um, <laughs> to say I the least. I can't believe how much news has happened in the last month. I, I mean, know. I know. In, in this day and age of uh, minute-by-minute hourly you know, updates and news and social media, it seems like a lot has happened since then. Uh, obviously, the big, the big topic of the day was uh, President Biden decided not to uh, seek re-election. He's, yeah. he's dropped out. So, um, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you, you, you think that's the party of uh, that saving democracy these days, or? Uh? Well, let me put a South Carolina, uh, uh, you know, anecdote on that. Before Biden got out, the numbers of Democrats who were enthusiastic about the upcoming election was so low that it was it seemed reasonably likely that the Senate Republican majority in South Carolina would increase you know, from 30 to 34, 35, maybe 36. Wow. And now that Biden has stepped away and there has been a surge in Democratic enthusiasm, it seems more likely that the majority will grow not by four or five or six seats, but by two, three or four seats. And so it it has substantially shifted the tectonic plates of politics up and down the ballot. And in particular... You know, that has pretty serious implications for governance uh, at the state house. Right. And and you mentioned that enthusiasm gap, um, yeah. you know, post that assassination attempt. Yeah, Republican enthusiasm has been, you know, through the roof right. this whole cycle. And a lot of that's driven by <laughs> very justified antipathy for the Biden administration and right. the state of the economy and the state of the border and all that. And that's got Republicans fired up. Plus... Uh, the the party's unified behind our nominee, and uh, now the Democrats have very rapidly closed the enthusiasm gap, which obviously has implications for their fundraising, the amount of volunteers they're getting knocking on doors, yeah, right. phone calls, all of that stuff has has just fundamentally changed it, it, for the better for Democrats yeah. since Biden stepped down. Yeah, and uh, what was that number? I think Kamala Harris raised what was it, a hundred, two hundred million? Yeah, it's a pile of money. Yeah. And there was a, you know, there was a time earlier in this cycle when um, just uh, Biden and the DNC had a, it, it was expected that they would outspend, the Democrats would outspend the Republicans somewhere in the neighborhood of one to two billion dollars nationally. And that, that was sort smokes. of, that was sort of baked in the equation for a good, a good chunk of this, you know, election season. And then right around the time Trump sewed up the nomination, Republican fundraising exploded, right? So what was once thought to be a structural Democratic advantage vanished and really became a Republican advantage. Republicans were outraising Democrats. And now Democrats have taken the lead again on fundraising. And, you know, why why does fundraising matter? Fundraising is mail pieces. Fundraising is TV ads, digital ads. Get out the vote, volunteers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and, 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 you know— since our last episode, you know, we talked about the assassination tip on Trump. Even if there were conservatives or Republicans that weren't crazy about voting for Trump, I think after that that attempt on his life, it really galvanized. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Well, there's that, and even the folks who were on the on the fringe. You know what I mean? Folks who were in the middle, even independents, yeah. who voted for Biden the last time, that were still sort of toss ups. I think when they saw that happened, his response to it, and then the, the, the RNC convention. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm going his way. And to his extraordinary credit, if you compare the way he ran his campaigns in 2016 and 2020, his campaign in 2024 has, has exhibited much greater message discipline. They have stayed focused on the things that matter to voters. And so long as he continues to do that, I still think he wins. I mean, Kamala Harris is a, a – Terrible can't. I mean, she. 
And right. you, you know, the Democrats had this, you know, wave of enthusiasm at the moment because there's somebody new and different and right. has a different set of infirmities than the guy she's replacing. Okay, at the so end let, of the day, she is terrible. Right. So let me interrupt. What what's the odds? What what are you thinking? Is is Harris the top of the ticket? Oh yeah. Yeah. Come November. I think that'll be the oh. Well, I mean, there was there was an episode in a in a field in Pennsylvania a couple of weeks ago that you know uh, right. So barring something like that, yeah, uh, yeah, I think she is the Democratic nominee, and okay. I think uh, she will enjoy um, tremendous enthusiasm from the mainstream media and one hundred percent Democrats at least through the first maybe second week in September, and then by that point, Republicans will have spent several hundred million dollars on TV and have reminded voters of why Kamala Harris was polling at 2% among Correct. Democratic primary voters when she ran in 2020. She's a terrible candidate. She, she believes in some crazy things yeah. that Americans find repulsive. She is the most liberal of the liberal. She is, yeah. She is the most far-left, crazy leftist nominee uh, in Ever, I mean, I, I yeah. Ever. So does she, does she go for a VP candidate, or does she try to find a running mate that recenters her at all? You know, and and again, I don't I don't know a lot of centrist Democrats that have a national profile, but someone like Manchin, someone of his ilk, that can maybe bring some blue collar folks back. You know, there's a lot of rumors going around that Kelly out of uh, Mark Kelly from Arizona, Arizona, yeah, maybe one uh, Shapiro. Mm-hmm. The governor of Pennsylvania, maybe one. Um, I don't know much about Shapiro, other than that he, you know, enjoys pretty high approval ratings mm-hmm. in in what what looks like you know Pennsylvania twenty twenty four is uh, like Ohio used to be, and before that, how Florida used to be, right? Sort of the the state around which the whole election will turn. So you know, maybe there's an advantage in bringing on a popular governor. In Josh Shapiro, I did read a thing. I can't remember if it was Punchbowl News or Politico or something that um, the Harris finance team um, made it very clear to uh, Wall Street donors that they need to hurry up and get their checks in because there would likely be a governor on the ballot. And when there is a governor on the ballot, those people who hold securities licenses are prohibited from giving more than two hundred and fifty dollars to. Uh, political campaigns under uh, MSRB rules. So really, so it that w- is interpreted as a tell that it's more likely to be a governor than a senator. Gotcha. And and that the strategy behind that would make sense. Yeah, you know, someone who's got some executive experience. You know, Harris doesn't have any. I mean, she she was attorney general, but she's never run a state. She's never. Yeah, nothing she's ever done. <laughs> It has a record, you know, it, she, she never left a job with a record that would commend her for some other job. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, the, everywhere she's gone, her record has commended her for private practice somewhere else. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're best suited to be a private citizen yeah. ba- based on the results of what you did in office. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting fall for sure. Um, yeah. So what do you think about uh, going to the other side of the aisle? Uh, you know, Trump um, selected his VP candidate in J.D. Yeah. Vance. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of liked the, the youthful... You know, he's not, you know, a Politico. You know, right. he's, a rel- he's a newcomer. Yeah. He just won the Senate seat, what, in 22? I believe that's right. Yeah, 22. Two years in the Senate, yeah. And and I actually appreciated Trump choosing someone that had been once a critic. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, I don't know. J.D.'s impressive. I mean, he's former Marine. He is. Um, and had his own business. I believe my, rec- my recollection on this is right. Um, he enlisted. And, yes, and so for I mean, there's a big difference between going in to the Marines as a as a commissioned officer and enlisting. Yes, and that that is uh, something to oh really, yeah, one hundred percent really recognize as a as an honorable act on his part. One hundred percent, because he then took advantage of the GI Bill, I believe. Yeah, to go to college, right? And and man, he it's not like he went to no offense to Toledo or Miami University in in Ohio there, or so, you know he didn't go to a small school. He went to, he went to Yale Law. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Didn't he, did he go to Ohio State? I don't know. That may uh, be a ding on his record. That, that may be. Uh, Sorry, that, Big Ten. That would <laughs> – man, I don't, I don't even – can you recover? Can you recover from that? Yeah, yeah. You know? But, but uh, you know – Do you get any votes out of SEC? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, 
but you know, I think he speaks to sort of that that blue collar ilk. Yeah. You know, I think he can help Trump. Um, you know, but I think Trump speaks to some of those folks anyway in Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. Um, but I think J.D. Vance can consolidate that. He can really bring that home, hopefully. It seems like, you know, net-net, that the choice of Vance was less about winning in 2024 than it was about um, maintenance of Trump's legacy after 2028. I was remember, at the time that the, the, the Vance pick was made, Republicans, I mean, we were as enthusiastic as we've ever been. I mean, it was post- Post the, the Butler, June debate yeah. and right after uh, the assassination attempt, and these guys were just totally sure that that Trump was going. I mean, they knew they were going to beat Joe Biden, right? Yes. And so, I think he made a pick more about legacy than he did 2024 electoral success. Because you think about some of the other potential vice presidential candidates, they would have brought more electorally to the table. But Vance brings more to the table on preservation of the the core political philosophy underlying Trump's political movement. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, so Vance is, is running in 28? That, I mean, if they, <laughs> Conventional wisdom it, says... D- describe to me a world where a 45-year-old vice president of the United States doesn't take a crack at yeah, right. running for, <laughs> running for and, president. And, you know, he, you know, he was just on the border here a few days ago. Yeah. And when he speaks to the fentanyl crisis, when he speaks to the byproducts of a terrible border policy... Yeah. You know that that rings true. It's a personal story for him. You know what I mean? He's lived it, and and so I thought that was very effective. Yeah, oh, I, thought, um, I think there's a lot that recommends him as a as a policymaker and a political leader. Yeah, I mean, not just a smart political guy, but he, he seems to be genuine. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and uh, and that's something I don't think you can fake. I think a voter, someone watching you on television, spots that from a mile away. Sure, yeah, and and I think Vance for me just rings true in. in and what he's saying. He lived a lot of life in yeah. his 40 years. And even when he criticized Trump, I mean, back in the 2016 years, um, he get he got asked that, I think, when he was running for Senate. And he said, listen, I got to acknowledge I was wrong. Yeah. He didn't, you know, him haul around. He didn't say, let us not be unburdened by what was. And you know what I mean? All that word salad. He just owned look, it. Look at the results. You know? Look at the results. <laughs> <laughs> and so... So yeah, man, it's going to be an interesting presidential campaign. Yeah. Um, and I, I just wonder what the early voting is going to do. You know, hearing <laughs> hearing the AOCs and some of these folks on on Twitter. You know, um, national elections aren't won in November; they're won in September. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh boy, here we go again. Wow. I mean. I mean, I don't know what context was for that statement, but but I do know that you know, thinking about our own campaigns, uh, yeah, if you hadn't won it six weeks out, you probably ain't gonna win it on election day. You, you know what I mean? And, and so begs the question: Why now for the Democratic Party? Why why was it so urgent right now for Biden to drop out? It's not like his mental state. You know, they're, they're claiming it was for for health reasons. What? I don't remember, or are they where, claiming I don't remember where this – so uh, Mike Donilon and Steve Reschetti are Biden's guys, right? I mean, they're the, the innerest of the – you know, they're the inner, inner, inner circle. Yeah, right. That weekend he made the choice. Donilon and Reschetti were both with him in, in Delaware at his, when he had COVID at his beach. Right. Place. And the way it has been reported – and this seems like a sensible thing. Donilon and Reschetti just had to deliver the news to him. Look, here's the polling data. You ain't going to win. So here's your, these are your choices. You can stay on the ballot, and you're going to lose. And your legacy will be, you know, think about it from the vantage point of a career, 50-year career Democrat. Yeah. Your legacy will be handing the presidency back to Donald Trump. That's the thing everyone's going to remember about you. Yeah. Or you can step down now and preserve an opportunity for Democrats to potentially win in November. That, that always struck me as a, you know, I mean, he's a cold-blooded political animal. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if he knows he can't win, steps out. Yeah. Well, Now, I don't know the degree to which he actually understands that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, you know, right. Maybe he had a good moment, you know? And, yeah. And the, the way he withdrew was really crazy. Well, in a Twitter statement? What was that? 
on non presidential stationery. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. And so what is it what does it say to the Democratic voters who they went out state by state and pulled the lever for that guy? Yeah. And the apparatus of that party, his close advisors, say you can't win. And so he didn't doesn't he does he does he does he not have a duty to honor those voters? I mean, literally, I, 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 have, <laughs> I have never experienced anything like this that yeah. you look at a poll. For instance, you and I are running for dog catcher, mm -hmm. and 65, 75 days before the election, we say, you know, man, we just had, we just had some bad polling data. Not going to run for dog catcher. Well, I think, okay, let me say this. But now, there, again, there, there, there we haven't a, won statewide primaries for dog said. But there's also a massive difference in the quantity and quality of data that goes into presidential campaign polling than what you and I would deal with. Correct. Right? I mean, we, you know, we're going to get three, 400 sample size poll. These guys are interspersing tremendous amounts of data analytics yep. along with along with public polling. Oh, they're doing focus groups. I mean, they, it is, yep. a, I mean, that's, it, it's a, in the case of a presidential game, it's two or $3 billion enterprise, right? So I, I would just say that they probably had the benefit of some dispositive data on, on the question. Right. And they probably looked at every way possible of reversing that and just concluded that they couldn't. But I, yeah. And I agree with you, but I still think he has a duty to those voters. He should have stuck it out. Yeah. I wish he had. <laughs> you know <what> I, mean? <laughs> I mean, maybe that's old school thinking, but yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, listen, your your time to decide if you're going to run or not mm -hmm. was Back then. six months, whatever it was ago. Yeah. Um, not, not, you know, 90 days before the election. Right. You know, he he has literally captured all the statewide primaries, got those delegates, and then a bait and switch. And and then every campaign ad that says Trump is an attack on our democracy just rings hollow. I don't care if it's Biden or if it's Harris. Yeah, that's right. That's fair. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, you know, that begs the next question. How does Harris win? <laughs> and again. I mean. I, uphill battle. But how does Harris win? How does she convince voters, independent voters, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Arizona, Michigan. How does she convince them that she has a track record? I don't think Kamala Harris can win, but I think Trump can lose. Okay. I mean, we, we talked about this a little bit. He has run an incredibly disciplined and organized campaign, which differs markedly from his campaigns in 2016 and 2020. Right. So if he is able to maintain message discipline and stay focused on things that voters care about, he will win. Yep, agree. If he does not do that, he will cause himself to lose. Yeah, I agree. So I don't think Kamala Harris can win, but I think Trump can lose. Based on I mean, but he he is the prohibitive favorite. Yeah. Well and and have you have you seen Donald Trump's latest um it might have been on Truth Social, it might have been on Rumble, I don't know. I I'm but did you see what he said about uh, uh, Kemp in Georgia, the Georgia election? Uh, not helpful, right? I mean, what do you what what does he? How does he benefit from that? <laughs> so how does that get you more votes? So again, I I'm the same way. Like I see, for instance, the debate. His performance during the debate, you saw the discipline, right? Yeah. You saw that he like he's been working out that discipline muscle. Yes. He wasn't taking the the low hanging fruit that Biden was throwing out there. He did, he was trying to stay away from personal attacks, even though he got in a jab or two, but I don't think he knows what he just said, <laughs> but that was good. That was well timed. Correct. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. he said, but he, yeah. he didn't just rub his nose in it. Right. Right. And, um, but then you, you read stuff like this and just for everybody who says, I mean, he basically goes on to talk, talk about, uh, Brad Raffensperger, secretary of state of Georgia, talking about, he needs to do a better job this go around in Georgia. Um, now again, I am not going to open up the 2020 election stolen yeah. debate. Well, I, saying, I mean, but on bottom, bottom, bottom line, right? Um, but he's got to stay Kemp, away from that. Kemp has consistently gotten more votes in Georgia than Trump has. Georgia is a state that Trump needs to win. Uh, maybe just, 
you know, if you don't want to have something nice to say, <laughs> right? you know, that and, would have been the smarter call here. And, yeah, and again, I thought Ryan Kemp's response to that tweet or whatever it was was, was right on. Yeah. He says, listen, I'm not going to get into personal attacks between me and, you know, Donald Trump. I am committed to making sure that Kamala Harris is beaten. There you go. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, some of those one-offs like that, I, I, you know, it's like that good Trump, bad Trump, and then ugly Trump. That's that's some of the stuff he's got to stay clear of this time around. Exactly. Yeah. But so. if you look, um, Chris LaCevita, Susie Wiles, you know, the really the architects of the Trump 2024 campaign have – and I'm, I mean, it is widely acknowledged, so not not breaking any ground here. Yeah. They have killed it. I mean, they have run an extraordinary campaign, which is why I think that Trump ultimately wins. Yeah. Because just the qual- look, the quality of the candidate, the quality of the campaign matters. The Trump campaign has been a well-oiled machine for running on 18 months. Kamala Harris just brought on a whole new set of consultants and strategists three days ago. Yeah, right. You know, I mean, they are totally disorganized. They don't know who has the ultimate decision making about what ads are going on TV. I mean, they, they're they starting from scratch with less than 100 days ago. Right. So I, I think on a, again, as long as Trump can stick to his message. Yeah. Gonna, I mean, it's going to be a huge win for him. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So. And good Lord, can we, please, can we, can he please win? You know, I mean, man, I Kamala tell you. Harris would be a disaster. Yeah, I, I just think, I mean, big picture, I think the folks that broke to Biden um, just because they were tired of, say, Trump on Twitter, yeah, uh, those that, that middle America is going to break to Trump this time. I think so, they, too. They understand, hey, it does matter. Mm-hmm. I voted for a guy, took a chance on Biden, and, I mean, just look at inflationary. Uh, pressures on our economy. Yeah, total bill of goods. I mean, they did a great job disguising what he actually believes in in 2020. Um, Hit him in a basement. Yeah, and he he has governed. He ran as a centrist placeholder. Correct. Really, I mean, if you distill the the message of his campaign from 2020, that was it. He governed as a radical left. I mean, he made Barack Obama look like a centrist. Correct. Yeah. It it has definitely gone way into a left ditch, and that's what I'm saying. I think independents have experienced enough to yeah. know not doing that one again. As much as Trump, I think, consolidates the Democratic Party more than other candidates, mm-hmm. I still think he's got enough to win. Yeah. So, um, again, we've got a special guest, Senator Wes Clymer. Thanks for joining us, man. Episode 27. Want to uh, talk about our sponsors. We have... Uh, Comer Distributing, obviously, um, the beer that we're drinking today. Um, thanks for bringing it in, man. Can you say it three times fast? I cannot. <laughs> uh, uh, Lagunitas Brewing Company. We're drinking daytime, a crisp session IPA. Only 4% yeah. alcohol. That's good. good. You know, these are that's a good poolside beer, you know. And three carbs and only 99 calories, 98 calories. I think if they are looking for a spokesperson for this beer, <laughs> a year old dish in sales. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> but yeah, what do you think about it? I mean, it's, it's really uh, good. Never had it before. Pretty good, good. light. Yeah. What is that? A little lemon in it? I don't know. Tastes like a light beer. Yeah, it's got some sort of citrus. You have or a more sophisticated palate. I'm right. Hamburgers and ketchup and well, you know. I, it may be remnants of something else I had in this nineteenth nineteenth uh, mm-hmm. cup, but. Um, Fastly becoming one of my favorite uh, Friday afternoon spots after a long week of work. Go by and check out the 19th. But uh, Great place to hang. It is, man. Yeah. And um, also, 742 North, home of the uh, Pints of Politics podcast. If you need desk space, workspace, or just a good cup of coffee at Forte Coffee Company, uh, stop by 742 North. All right. Well, thanks again, uh, Senator Wes Clymer, for joining us. Um, you know, we, we've covered some uh, some national um, issues. Let's talk about, you know, here local around the state. Um, obviously both you and I are both up, up for re-election. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I know we've got school coming back then Labor Day. Typically we'll start, uh, walking neighborhoods and, yeah. and doing those types of campaign events, uh, here in about two, three weeks. Yeah. Um, be doing a little door knocking myself, man. I'm hoping for, <laughs> for it to cool down just a little bit. <laughs> Can we can we get it below ninety? Okay. Yeah, I know, yeah. man. So, um, so yeah, 
you and I could probably do some stuff, uh, morning coffee in a couple of neighborhoods that we share. Yeah. Um, and then go door knock. It um, is the best part of campaigning. I know. Knock, I like that knock too. Knocking on doors, asking people if they can, you know, if you can I earn your vote? I enjoy that one-on-one yeah. uh, a lot more than speaking um, to 400 people Yeah. where you can't really have, you know, a lot of folks have just unique situations. Um, whether it's a tax issue, whether it's a, you know, kid that, you know, unfortunately went to prison, has a, you know, and now he doesn't qualify for certain benefit. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. All, yeah. all those types of things. And they're not going to say that in a room full of 20, 30 people they don't know. Sure. Yeah. No, so you when, learn You learn a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. It's fun and it's helpful. Yep. I mean, it makes you better at what you do. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so keeping in mind, let, let's be optimistic. Mm-hmm. You and I, you and I both go to a November election and, and we're successful and we win. Um, what are some priorities that maybe you have? Maybe not. Um, well, let's talk about it personally. Mm-hmm. And then maybe um, maybe just in your chamber. What are you hearing? What are you thinking that maybe the body will go to? Sure. Um, keeping in mind what, what we just came out of this last session. Um, I, th- I think one of the bigger subjects, at least early in the session, on the Senate side will be picking up where the House left off on a conversation around energy and utilities. Yeah, right. I mean, it is it is really painfully obvious uh, that the state does not have enough electricity generation. Everyone, we, everyone you talk to, we need more generation on our level. Yeah. We're what a decade behind yeah, as far I mean, as on look, the generation the, side. The, not saying we can't keep up, but or we can. and Santee Cooper uh, attempted to build a nuclear power plant, which would have solved the the state's base load generation needs mm-hmm. over a long period of time. Well, the you know they they failed at that. Right. Uh, we did not need the generation. We, need, <laughs> you know, right. we, we were doing that for a reason. Yeah, I mean, our population continues to <clears throat> to grow. You know, the chart is geometric, right? Right. We're, you know, going to grow by a million people from you know twenty twenty to twenty thirty, and and there's a, a lot of it's a lot of economic activity, right? That, that comes and, with that. And I'm glad you brought that up. York being one of the one of five counties yeah, that are going to receive eighty yeah. percent of that influx. What right. was it? Ori, Berkeley. Uh, Greenville, Spartanburg, and York. Yeah. Something like that. Our po- and so the, the projection was 119,000 people in York County. That is uh, 42% growth from 2020 to 2030. Right. Where are they going to put all these people? I know, man. Yeah. And, and you know, folks are complaining about affordable housing right now. Yeah. Not, not to get off the subject of energy. But so let's talk to the two listeners out there about, you know, the House did make an attempt mm-hmm. last session. Yeah. And I know... Let's see, uh, in 23, we formed a, sort of an ad hoc energy um, committee. Um, I don't know why the Senate wasn't a part of that. I, you know, I wasn't in all those conversations, but it seems, hindsight being 2020, knowing the outcome of the House bill, it might have helped that we had formed a bicameral ad hoc. That way, um, interested senators and reps yeah. could have been <clears throat> working on this solution together. Um, and, and, and so we, we got that bill, I believe that was house bill 5118. We got that over to y'all. What, what happened with that? What was the crux of that demise? So anytime you're dealing with utility issues, right? If you, if you change a comma in utility law, (laughs) you change, you move an inch over here and it moves an outcome 10 miles out in the real world. Mm -hmm. So good energy policy, good utility regulation has to be done very, very, very carefully. It requires a great deal of precision. You need to ask hard questions. You need to understand second, third, and you know, right. fourth order effects of, of what you're doing because fundamentally you're, you're changing incentives for every single consumer in the state and multi-billion dollar businesses that are very sophisticated at exploiting loopholes that, let's say, they sometimes they create right. in – in state law, <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's, that's how, that's how rate payers are currently paying, was it $12 billion? Rate payers are paying $12 billion for a nuclear plant that, that will never produce right. any electricity, right? So we got to be very, very, very careful. Anyway, uh, that bill came over from the House plenty early in the session for the Senate to have given it fair consideration. Uh, and there's just not a polite way to say this. The, the committee that has jurisdiction over uh, utility laws is the Judiciary Committee. I serve on the Judiciary Committee. The chairman of the Judiciary Committee, um, for whatever reason, I don't know, 
I mean, I asked. He never had an answer. Uh, he just never scheduled subcommittee meetings to investigate this issue, to give it a fair hearing, to hear from a, a variety of different voices and experts on you – know, this was a big bill, right? It dealt with uh, building a new combined cycle gas plant. Yeah. It, it fundamentally changed uh, the way that uh, major – uh, electric generating projects are permitted. I mean, yep. massive, massive permitting reform. It was a, it was a big bill, yes. right? And um, and it didn't it make some change in the makeup of the of the commission. Changed the public service commission. The, yeah, the guys who set utility rates, who determine what you know, all of us right. have to pay for electricity. Right. Um, so, so but, do you think it was just a move too fast? It was uh, the word I used at the time. I believe was appropriate then. It's appropriate now. It was just a haphazard public policy process in the Senate. Okay. And so when that bill came up in the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, in the full committee, came out of subcommittee after one meeting, then it came in the full committee. Um, I believe the chairman, Chairman Rankin, put forward a ninety-page strike and insert amendment. So it would have st- deleted everything that was in the bill and replaced it with these ninety pages. Right. I made it through. 27 or so pages of the bill during that committee meeting. The House version or the strike and insert? The strike and insert. Yeah, <laughs> okay. like this is what I'm getting ready to have to vote on. Yeah. And um, I'd written down two pages of questions that th- these were not got. I mean, these were just like legit. Okay, t- help me understand why, you know, the bill creates this new energy policy organization. Why are we, why this instead of that? Right. Help me understand the, I just want to understand it. Yeah. Nobody can answer any questions. I mean, it was it was almost comical. It was sad, you know. I mean, you know, do you do you cry or do you laugh? I mean, <laughs> right. There was n- nobody in the room could answer any questions, and so I made a motion to send the bill back to subcommittee, which got the hackles up of you know the chairman and some of the senior members of the committee. And I said, fine, I'm I will. You pick three questions here. I'll ask three. If somebody in the room can give a satisfactory answer to one of them, then I'll withdraw my motion. <laughs> they didn't do that. They didn't yeah. take me up on the offer, right? So anyway, it ha- and, and I wasn't the only person who felt that way. M- uh, a large number of senators felt like th- yeah. that th- there just wasn't enough study done. It's too big of an issue, too important. And so um, anyway, I think the, the president of the Senate intends to get some substantive work done on this bill before we get back into Go session back. in January. Okay. And I think I don't want to jump on his news. I think he'll have some news. He will have some news on that in the very near future. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, that's a major issue. Touches every single person in the state. Absolutely. And, you know, and again, we don't want to break any any news, but is, is that going to be something that the House can assist with or the House can be a part of that, you know, whether it's a working group or whatever? Because, you know, it's the same sort of thing that, uh, Senator Davis, you know, he yeah. had worked for he's worked for years on a medical marijuana bill. Mm-hmm. That bill came over early and it wasn't a priority in the House, you know, and so it sort of fizzled. Um, not to say that I would have passed it. Um, and then when the schedules changed on marijuana, it really threw a curveball yeah. for for our consideration. And, you know, we just didn't know what to do with it. Um so I just don't want to repeat similar mistakes because you keep repeating the same mistake. You're going right, to yeah. get similar outcomes. Similar outcome. So I would um, imagine that the Senate's process begins with the House bill as a starting point. Yeah. I mean, that would seem – I don't know that that's going to be the case, but I think that would make sense um, given the uh, extraordinary amount of work that the House put into. Yeah. And so for the two listeners, on the House side, we have uh, labor, commerce, and industry. Yeah. That's where this energy bill came out of. You guys don't have – that it's it's funny that our the energy bill went to judiciary so over in the Senate. The Senate Labor, Commerce, and Industry Committee used to have jurisdiction over utility issues until um, Glenn McConnell, who was then the chairman of the Judiciary Committee and and President Pro Tem of the Senate, uh, widely respected, obviously very powerful guy. Uh, he moved utility jurisdiction to his committee, and there it has remained. And, you know, there's some decent chance that the Senate will debate um, moving utility jurisdiction back to LCI. I think you can make the case that alignment of the committee composition, House and Senate, makes sense. Senate judiciary is usually populated by junior Republicans and senior Democrats, whereas LCI 
is populated by senior Democrats and senior Republicans. And who's who's chair of else or y'all's labor? Davis. Okay. And then um, it would also include members of finance and judiciary committees, which is a an obvious asset anytime you're dealing with utility issues because they're inevitably implications for um, yeah state correct. fiscal policy. Yep. Yeah. I tell you, man, I'm I'm just a common sense guy. I just. It would make more sense. W- that, that stuck out to me. When you said yeah. the Art Energy Bill went over to your judiciary, I was like, what? Yeah, but, it's weird. Well, that, you know, that's why I've stayed on the Judiciary Committee. I had a couple opportunities to go to finance, but stayed on Judiciary to deal with the utility issues because they just they just matter so much. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, I mean, everybody pays a power bill yeah. for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, What? so energy, obviously a big topic. Um, you know, the Senate sort of flirted around with the tort reform. Mm-hmm. Um, is that going to come back up, you think, or have you heard any, any updates or? So that's. I know that didn't make it out of committee. No, it got to the floor. Did it? Uh, it got to the floor and um, was filibustered. And okay. And the majority leader, Senator Massey from Edgefield, over the course of those negotiations, I think there's this is a fair way to characterize it. I don't know if I've ever heard him say this, but this is the way I interpreted it. Um, he just said, look, the, the the bill is on the floor. If we have the votes for the bill that's on the floor, then we have the votes to pass something. But I'm not negotiating. I'm not watering it down anymore. And if, you know, you on the other side who's against doing this bill, if you don't accept this, I guarantee you Senate Republicans come back with more votes for a stronger bill next year. So basically he just said, I'm not going to water it down this year. I'm going to wait till next year when there are more Senate Republicans who support Tort reform, tort reform and do a bigger, stronger bill next time. Okay. Which really then sets up a, a kind of fascinating conflict with the House because the composition of the Senate shifts away from, I'm not saying dominated by trial lawyers, but trial lawyers have less influence in the Senate in 2025 than they did in 2024. Trial right. lawyers will maintain their their degree of influence in the House, and so I think the conflict flips. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think that bill that y'all were considering tackled, it was sort of a, an omnibus of, of tort reform, right? Yeah. It, it tried to tackle the liquor liability. It tried to tackle um, what that 2017 case of um, joint and several, right? Yeah. It tried to mm-hmm. – um, I, I just wonder if there's a, an opportunity that we can just – because tort reform is the heavier lift – just the umbrella of tort reform. I wonder if there's a, an opportunity that we can single out liquor liability and solve that problem for our small business owners in South Carolina. Alabama just did it. They're, you know, they, they they clearly identified some requirements um, that put it on the individual who's doing the the consuming. Yeah. Well, so there, you know, there, there there's a real tension in that in the pro tort reform coalition. Right. Right. <laughs> because the, you know, the, the, the group that just really is taking it on the chin here are, you know, owners of, of bars and restaurants and hotels and yep. music venues and places. I mean, a lot of these places are having to close because their insurance costs are, are yeah. just astronomical. But the, the pro tort reform coalition also includes a lot of small businesses that, that aren't in the hospitality oh, yeah. industry. Construction, that, trucking, trucking, all, you know, all these things. And, um, you know, my hope would be that uh, the General Assembly would not simply deal with the, the the alcohol component, but do a sweeping tort reform that cleaned it up for everybody. Because at the end of the day, the reason why this thing matters, it's, it's you know, when your legal system is out of balance, it creates a hidden tax on every consumer. Yeah, correct. Everybody pays more for everything they buy because we have this out-of-whack tort system. Yeah, and Whether it's settlements or, or you know, jury verdicts yeah. are just astronomical. Right. And again, we can boogeyman insurance all day, but, you know, when when they cannot predict or measure the risk in right. whatever the industry is, right? Yeah. they're either going to leave mm-hmm. or they're going to make sure they get a return. Sure. Insurance companies don't offer insurance uh, as a charity. They, <laughs> right. If they don't make money, they're not going to offer it, you know? So, uh, yeah. And again, I'm all for uh, overall tort reform. Yeah. Um, I just, because I understand that's going to be a heavier lift 
Yeah, well, look, I mean, I, this is, I say this a lot. I, I don't understand why God sends some of the people he does to the General Assembly, right? <laughs> but I do understand that my duty is to do the best I can with the people God has sent down there. To, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And so if, if it ends up being that, uh, that the only thing that can pass is dealing with the, the alcohol component, do that. Do the best you can. Yeah. Do the best you can with the, with the votes you have in that moment. Well, hopefully we can do something. Um, that is one thing that I'm going to host in September over at Hoppin. Okay. I think we're narrowing in on date of September the 18th. Uh-huh. I believe okay. that's a Wednesday. Yeah. So might get uh, Will Kenny up. Yeah. Man, the Insurance resident expert. Will. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he, he can make us look smarter. So more than welcome to. Uh, uh, you, when, if you're sharing <laughs> a stage with Will, he ain't going to make you look smarter. He's going to make him look smarter. <laughs> But, yeah, you, I mean, and I told Johnson the same thing. Hey, man, pull up a chair because um, I love to get y'all's, y'all's insight from where you yeah. sit in the Senate, you know. Yeah. Um, us on the House, we, you know, we, we might have a different perspective. and Sure. Uh, like you said, we may have a more of an uphill fight with our lawyer, legislative members. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. <laughs> but um, what yeah, else? It's funny. I mean, it, 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 it bears saying, you know, there's – I'm not saying there's – three political parties in the General Assembly. There's mm-hmm. all different kinds of political parties in the General Assembly, but a, a common watch, watch your mouth. A common <laughs> a common division among legislators is not trial lawyers and trial lawyers. <laughs> <You know? laughs> hey, speaking of trial lawyers, um, wh- what do you think about the uh, judicial reform? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm happy that serious progress was made. Yeah. Uh, I lament that more progress was not made, which goes back to what I was saying a second ago. You do the best you can with the the people who were there. I, if you had told me in January that what the governor signed would be signed, I'd consider that a win. Right. You know, I, I didn't think— You didn't get everything. I didn't get everything. Oh, man. We, we, I know. We didn't get a frack. I mean, you know, we got a proportional what the goal was. Yep. But we got the governor has seats on the Judicial Merit Selection Commission that screens judicial candidates. There are term limits on JMSC members. So I, no I longer, like that. No longer can the uh, lawyer legislator become entrenched on the JMSC. And I like the service years that they have already been in there. Yeah. It removes some, takes care of some urgent problems on right. personnel on the JMSC. I, I, it, it shows immediate change, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. that's immediate change in membership. It signals to voters that we, we hear you. Yeah. You know, e- again, even if it was just a perception issue, we hear you. We made immediate changes. Well, and, the, you know, the the mere presence of people on the on the screening commission who were not beholden to a legislator or a legislator him or herself. Right. Will result in serious cultural changes on the JMSC. Yeah, I agree. It, it's not it, – no longer is it just uh, – Backslap and legislative. Everybody's gonna take care of everybody else. You got a legitimate outside interest because the executive branch and the legislative branch butt heads all the time, <laughs> right? And so, I like it that it forces everybody to get in the boat. What do you mean by that? Everybody, you're forcing everybody to get in a vessel, mm-hmm. share the vessel, yeah, and deal with the outcome, right? I mean, it it, it adds some accountability. To who who gets qualified out? Yeah, exactly. It makes it harder for a handful of people to play games that disenfranchise. Yeah, the and state. you can't do, right? You yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> which one of y'all kicked me? <laughs> you know, right? Um, so I think that's important. I, I think folks, when when troubling, you know, decisions come from the bench, there needs to be accountability, right? Right. And um, it'll trace back to wait a minute, how this guy even get there? Sure. Right, and when a handful of lawyer legislators continually get verdicts that invite questions, right? Eh, maybe you got to put an end to that too. Again, it's the it's, you know, it was like the 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 amendment we put on um, Spencer Wetmore's bill about not allowing House members to run to be campaign managers in House mm-hmm. campaigns. Yeah. You can go run a sheriff's race. You can go run a Senate race. You can go run dog catch or whatever. Go do corporate PR. Correct. You know? But you just can't because of the potential for the conflict of interest. Mm-hmm. It's not saying someone's corrupt. Right. Um, you know, 
that is a tendency sometimes that people want to throw around. That man's corrupt because of the way he voted. Instead of, because it is, it is harder, right? It's, it's harder to sit down with someone you don't ideologically, you know, in simpatico with and, and say, hey, why did you vote that way? Right. And then take their word for it. It's very easy to just rush to a camera, rush to a microphone, and say that person's corrupt. Yeah, it's very easy to say. Yeah. You know? Um, but, uh, you know, so many people say stuff like that now that I think there was a time in American political life when such claims meant something. But now if, if everyone is something, then that means no, no one, one is something. No one is something. That is correct. But, yeah. So um, well, you, just a random aside on this point you raised, and I, I think you, you did a really good thing introducing that subject in the, in the House, and I think – that should be enacted for the um, clean government public policy interest there, but also, and maybe something that not a lot of folks have thought about, uh, the state of Iowa has this law. Oh, really? Yes, and the reason why they have a law like this is to prevent their legislators from getting paid by presidential candidates for their endorsements. And so I think one of the greatest things South Carolina has going, it matters a lot to us economically and otherwise, is first in the South primaries. Yeah. And taking steps to preserve the sanctity of that process will yield benefits to our ability to retain our favored status as the first in the South primary. Because I still, I want every Republican and Democratic presidential candidate when they're contested primaries to have to know what Clover is and Correct. Fort Mill is and York is yeah. instead of just knowing that there's a Charleston, a Columbia, and a Greenville. Right. You know? Yeah, you're going to come down here and work. You're going to come down here and work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is right. Um, so energy, tort reform. Yeah. I know in the House, I'm, I'm going to go back to the well on the pricing transparency for uh, medical billing. Very good. Um, yeah. Unsuccessful so, last time. Talk more about that. Or maybe you've, um, I don't want to be redundant. To no, no, no. It, it's it. it's pretty simple. I think the two listeners uh, remember us talking about this in an early episode. It um, basically, if you if you go to uh, receive medical care um, from a hospital or a ambulatory surgical center, which is where a lot of your heavier capital intensive surgeries and those types of things go on, um, they got to give you an itemized receipt. A plain language itemized receipt. Yeah, um, pretty straightforward. We, you know, we don't have to know all the all the um, IV drugs that you take itemized. You know, because and when we say plain language, we're talking seventh eighth grader language. Sure, right. Yeah. Um, and a lot of hospitals, to their credit, in South Carolina already do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, they go ahead and give a, a three page invoice that documents why we're charging you or your health uh, insurance provider $35,000, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but not all do. And so I think when we start looking at how to address driving down costs in healthcare, which you know more than anybody is just through the roof and constantly rising, yeah. um, we've got to know what we're paying for. Exactly. The patients need to understand how much does this, how much is it going to cost me? Um, so I think I'm going to go back to the well again and, and see what we can work with. It's a really good idea whose time has long since come. It, and it's common sense. Um, you know, th there's no surprise billing on a federal level right now for folks who receive, um, you know, government health care. Mm -hmm. So why, why not private have sure. to? Yeah. Or meet, people who pay cash. Meet the same standard, you know? Yeah. So, um, also looking at uh, non medical non-competes. Yeah. Get rid of those. Physicians can't be held captive mm -hmm. to um, hospitals, healthcare groups, um, private equity that own them. Yeah. It's really fascinating. It's a fascinating subject for a limited government conservative, right? Because on the one hand, you would say the government shouldn't intercede in private contracts right. to that degree. On the other hand, you would say that, well, Physicians enter into a fiduciary relationship with their patient, with their patients, and so a contract that abrogates that fiduciary responsibility shouldn't have been entered into in the first place. Right. Uh, so there's a tension in conservative thought. <laughs> I uh, know. But I think you err on the side of economic liberty, and you err on the side of taking care of patients. Yeah. Well, and I, I think, for me, that's that's the common sense. Yeah. You know, I think the patient and the doctor should be at the forefront of driving 
healthcare outcomes for the patient. For sure. Instead of some administrator. Um, when the accountants are in charge of healthcare, we're all worse off. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But uh, but yeah. So another thing I know it's on a federal level is is pharmaceutical benefit managers, known as PBMs. Yeah. Um, just just getting in, cracking the surface on that. So I mean, we can tease it to the two listeners, but um, I'll be I've been having a lot of good conversations with with folks on you know, sort of the origin of PBMs, Mm -hmm. how that started, and then the insurance capture, so to speak. Yeah. Or the vertical integration, as Mm -hmm. it's called. Sure. Um, You know, when we talk about healthcare, a lot of the healthcare and how you might be able to make it more competitive or drive down costs is associated with pharmaceuticals, right? And when 80% of the drugs that we consume are controlled by, I believe it's three, Mm-hmm. companies, that's a problem. Uh, 94% of the drugs that we take are controlled by six. And they, um, can't, they can't tell you how they make their decisions because that's proprietary. <laughs> 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 well, and also the, the thing of, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, it's, it's an oyster right now. I'm just cracking it open and, and seeing what's inside. So If you figure that out, they're going to name – I mean, then we should rename the state house. The, <laughs> no, I don't. The Christopher Heath I, Sessions. I don't think. <laughs> listen, I, I think folks, you know, whether it's, you know, it's just it's it's just setting off some alarms in my brain. Oh yeah. It's from a, from whether it's an wait a minute, you mean the insurance company owns the pharmaceutical benefits, but it's not. You know what I mean? And it's offshored, and there's reasons for that. And so, it, you know, just I have questions. Yeah. You know, whether it's an antitrust thing, um, whether PBM should have a fiduciary if they want want to operate in the state. But, you know, PBMs originally had an obligation, fiduciary obligation to the patient. Mm -hmm. And I don't, here in South Carolina and on federal level, they don't have to. There would not be any evidence of (laughs) PBMs honoring such a (laughs) fiduciary obligation, you know? You know? Yeah. And that drives up costs. It does. Yeah. So uh, it's almost like a value-added tax. It's a VAT. It's a hidden. <laughs> right. It's a hidden tax in the in the healthcare system. So yeah, I you know in know some folks who represent that industry, and um, I'm looking forward to sitting down and talking to them. Yeah. So excellent. But yeah, man. Well, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's been um, good. Yeah, I think we're out almost out of time, but want to again um, thank. Gonna- before we part, well, yeah, we, yeah. Have, we we really dropped the one. We have not given Guffy a hard time for <laughs> for skipping out on the show today. I know, man. How disappointing to your two listeners. You know, we're talking about duties. <laughs> yeah. You know, and responsibilities, and just shirking them to run off to uh, a legislator conference. Legislator conference. Come on. Come on. Man. <laughs> you got responsibilities at home. <laughs> I, I'm ready to reset the camera. But y'all want to talk about Guffy more? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, him and Senator Johnson are having a good time in, uh, at the conference. So yeah, they did check in. They did. Yeah. Yeah. They called, gave us a to-do list. You know, we're like, yeah, yeah. And it made it to the trash can as we came in the front door. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you know, uh, representative Guffey and Senator Johnson have said that they will take responsibilities for next week's episode. So we need to be careful. So, uh, (laughs) (laughs) but yeah, uh, but again, I want to thank our, um, Senator West Clymer for joining us and uh, filling in for Representative Guffey. Appreciate it, man. Hey, thanks for having me. And then also um, Comer Distributing for providing this uh, delicious summertime beer. Uh, Lagunitas Brewing Company. The beer name is called Daytime, a crisp session IPA, and only 98 calories. Pretty good beer. Pretty good, man. Yeah. Also, uh, Podcast Home, 742 North. If you need desk space, workspace, or just a good cup of coffee, stop by and visit 742 North right here in uh, Rock Hill. Thanks for listening. Uh, we'll see you uh, next week. Anything you want or who you want to be, you can be. Just remember those who make this life so easy.